John. We're good. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, well, again, good morning. Good to see everybody out uh, today. Um, thank you, Kelson, for reading the scripture reading, and uh, also thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present a lesson. Um, for those that are visiting with us today, I'm not the typical speaker. Um, Kevin uh, is out of town uh, this week, so I'm filling in for him. Uh, so if you're expecting uh, some well-seasoned, eloquent speech or lesson, you're not going to get that today, um, but, but I'll do my best. Um, today is also Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Um, we are talking about love, uh, but today's not, not a, a Mother's Day lesson, per se, uh, although it's still applicable. You should definitely love your moms. Uh, but yeah, we're not, we're, not doing, we're not doing a themed lesson today. Um, so today we're talking about, as the scripture, read, as the scripture reading um, insinuated, we're talking about love today. And the ultimate motivator of why we do the things we do, uh, which is love. Um, and then just to kind of give a little background and context, um, I just wanted to go back and talk about the differences a little bit between the old law and the new law. Um, the old law uh, was very command driven. Uh, for example, we have the Ten Commandments, right? You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, covet, uh, and so on and so on. And that you can find that in Exodus chapter 20. God emphasized the importance of obedience to the Israelite people uh, in the old law. The old law was full of commands, uh, which included observing many feasts, uh, observing holy days, and the obl obligatory animal sacrifices. And these sacrifices, they were labor intensive, they were time consuming, inconvenient, bloody, and just downright gross and disgusting. The imagery that God used uh, for these sacrifices helped convey his view of just how serious he was about the uncleanness of sin. Now contrast that idea of the old law with the new law. In the New Testament, Jesus comes and he emphasizes not only obedience, but the intent of the heart. He does this many times throughout the Gospels. Um, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter 5. He uses this phrase repeatedly um, in Matthew 5 in particular. He says, you have heard that it is said to those of old. He says that about four or five times in that chapter alone. And then he continues to build upon the old law. Um, so in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So Jesus takes this old law teaching of you shall not murder. And then he takes it another step further by adding not to hate our brother. That's the intent of our heart. No longer is it just good enough to simply not murder but we also must guard our hearts by not allowing hate as well as other impure thoughts to control our actions and to control our motives. So what I'm trying to convey here is this idea of obeying God, not solely based on duty-driven commands, but the reason that we obey him is because we love him and we want to obey him. Okay, so we're going to take a look um, at this next verse. It's in John chapter 14 and verse 15. I'm gonna, I kind of want to think about it in two different parts. We have uh, the first part, if you love me, and then the second part, keep my commandments. Pretty simple verse. It's repeated 
many other passages as well, this idea. Um, so how I've kind of divided it up here is that we keep his commandments, and this is something that is something that we have to do. God said it, just like in the old law, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. We have to do it because God said to, right? And then we have the if you love me side of things, which is the condition, the condition to keep my commandments. Now this implies that when we love something or someone, it's something that we want to do. It's not a burden. It's not necessarily hard because we love that thing or we love that person. It's something that we want to do. Um, so again, with something that we have to do as far as keeping commands, it's oftentimes obligatory. It's duty driven. We feel that we have to do it because after all, God said to do it just like a, a child with their parent. Well, mom and dad said to clean your room. Well, I have to do it. I don't want to do it, but I have to because mom and dad said to, right? Um, another way of thinking of keeping commands is a box checker, right? So I did what I was supposed to do. Maybe I didn't want to do it, but, you know, I, I gave to the poor. I, I you know, I tithe. Um, I'm generous. Um, you know, I show up to church. I do the work of the Lord. But as the scripture reading that we read, that Kelson read for us, um, if we do all these things without love, it is worthless. It is meaningless. So if I'm just keeping the commands of the Lord and I'm showing up, and I'm being generous, but my heart isn't in it, it's, it's worthless if I'm not doing it for others, if I'm not doing it for God. Um, another reason why we, we may keep commands, and, and mind you, all these reasons for keeping commands are not, not necessarily good reasons. I'm, I'm giving you the, the not good reasons for keeping commands. Uh, another reason why we may keep the commands are for show. Well, hey, look at me. Look at, look at all the good stuff I did. Um, kind of self-indulgent, uh, selfish motives. Um, another reason here is uh, I'll lump these two together, expectations and peer pressure. Um, sometimes we do the things that we do is because our family or our friends uh, or our brethren within the church um, expect us to do certain things um, or we are peer pressure into doing uh, certain things um, and those aren't the right reasons for keeping the commands the right reasons of course is because we love God and we want to serve him um, if you love me these are the things that the reasons why we do the commands is because we want to do it and this implies something that is genuine uh, it's heartfelt, it's from the heart, um, it's driven by compassion, um, and we do these things or we do these commands because we want to please the person or we ultimately want to please God. And if you put the love in with the keep my commandments, if you love me, keep my commandments, you really can't you really can't have that without the love. So the reasons why we do what we do as Christians is important. So we're going to talk about um, four different topics here about, uh, about why we do the things that we do. So we're going to talk about, uh, well, first we're going to talk about giving, being generous. We're going to talk about generosity, hospitality, um, and we're also going to talk about laboring for the Lord, uh, doing the work of the Lord, and the reasons, the reasons that we should have, why we do these things. Um, so first, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, verse 1 talks about now concerning the ministering of the saints. So this is what uh, the context is here. We're talking about being generous and giving to the saints. Uh, Kevin just gave a, a great lesson on this just several or a few weeks ago on uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, so I don't have to belabor the point here too terribly much. Um, but starting in verse 6, it says, but this, 
I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful cheerful giver. Um, So here in this passage, um, in this case, there really isn't a command here saying you have to give. But God is saying that you should want to give, and if you do give, you should give it from the heart as he purposes in his heart. This is something that we decide, that, you know what, I want to be generous, I want to give, so whatever I decide I want to give is appropriate, right? Um, So again, this is, in this case here, not necessarily a command, but again, the intent of the heart that our generosity comes from how comes from the love of the brethren and how um, we want to do these things. Um, Romans chapter 12. We'll take a look at Romans chapter 12, starting verse 9. Romans 12, verse 9, Let your love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Um, This verse does talk about being generous, distributing, giving to the needy saints. Um, But notice in the first couple of verses it talks about love again, and this is going to be a pretty common theme throughout all these passages as far as like what motivates us to do the things that we do, what motivates us to give, right? Um, be, Be kindly affectionate with one another and love the brethren. If we can do that, if we can love one another, all these all these commands, if you will, or all the things that we do, it's going to be a whole lot easier if we have that love for one another. It's not something that is a burden or something that, oh man, I gotta, you know, I gotta give this week or I have to tithe or somebody's in need, so I guess I better help them out because that's an expectation put upon me. Uh, Verse 9, it says, let love be without hypocrisy. What What does that mean, be love without hypocrisy. Have you heard of, I mean, so the verse, right, that I'm thinking about is um, those who proclaim God but deny his power, or have a form of godliness but deny his power. Do you know how many people are out there that are getting wealthy or trying to get influence or power um, based off of the scripture? And that's what I think of is let your love be without hypocrisy is that they are showing or they're pretending to do the commands of God um, not for the right reasons and then their love becomes hypocritical because sure they may be doing all the things that are listed in the word right but it's hypocritical if you don't actually have a genuine love for your brother Uh, next point here is hospitality Uh, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Again, I'm, I'm talking about hospitality here, and hospitality can be can take many different forms. It could be having people over, sharing a common meal. Uh, it could be just uh, spending time with one another or taking care of one another um, in many different ways. But again, the interesting thing again is. The qualifier, if you will, the verse preceding this is have love for one another. 
if we have that love for one another, again, things like this, being hospitable, it's going to be a whole lot easier. And I do think it's interesting that at the end of this verse, he puts without grumbling uh, or complaining, as many other your translation might say, without complaining or without grumbling. And it, that kind of indicates if, if you're being hospitable, but you're complaining about it, that kind of takes away the whole love idea that we're talking about. If I have to, you know, um, I'm having some friends over over the weekend, and we're going to have lunch, but, you know, I have, to, I have to prepare, I have to clean my house, I have to make more food depending on who shows up, and then I got to clean up afterward, and, you know, it's just a big hassle, it's a burden. If I'm complaining about it, then... Then, then why even why even do this? Why even go out of the way to be hospitable or, or take care of your brother? Because what it's saying here is that if you're going to complain about it, you're not doing it in a loving way. Um, or another example, I think Patrick liked that, that first one. But um, another, <laughs> another example, um, you know, if you're having, you know, maybe you're uh, having people over uh, on the weekend, right, or, or overnight, and uh, and the only reason why I bring this up is because I've just, I'm not, I'm not pointing anybody out here, but I'm just saying, like, I've, throughout life, I've, I've, I've just, I've heard things uh, on this order, but, uh, you know, so-and-so spending the night at our house, they're driving through, they're staying for the night, but man, I have to, again, I gotta clean, I have to, you know, wash the sheets, and you know, and after the company leaves, they don't—they don't even clean up after themselves, and I have to—I have to go back and clean, and—and and, you know, it's just a real hassle, and it may be. But the point here is that if we're doing it in a loving way, because we genuinely love the brothers and the sisters, then complaining shouldn't even be part of our heart. It shouldn't even be part of the reasons that we do why the do the things that we do. Again, it's something that we should want to do because we have that love, not something that, you know, God says to command, I have to be hospitable, so I guess I guess I got to do it, right? That, that's not the point here. Um, the example of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. I'll go ahead and go over there as well. We'll read that. Um, Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 30. Um, we'll notice that the Samaritan was motivated by compassion, by love for his brother. Luke chapter 10 and verse 30, it says, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by, by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set on him, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out to Denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, uh, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Um, so again, this is, this is the Good Samaritan. You had a, a Levite and you had a priest that passed on by the man who was half dead on the side of the road. And of anybody those who knows the commands and those who knows what they should do the most would be the priest or the Levite, and yet they continued to walk by. Maybe they were thinking in their minds, like, hmm, I probably should help them, but, you know, I'm running late for work. I gotta, you know, go do whatever, or too busy, didn't have the time. If anybody should have done it, it should have been the priest, right? But then you have a Samaritan come on by, and it says he was moved with compassion. And it wasn't really even a matter for the Samaritan. It wasn't really a matter of thinking and stopping, hey, should I help this person or should I not? It was, 
He saw a human that was in need, a person who was in trouble, and he had compassion on that person. So he went and he bandaged his wounds and he took, took care of them. And you know, if the, if the story ended there, if it was just the Samaritan saw the guy, he was, you know, maybe he was bleeding out, he bandaged him up, controlled the bleeding, and he was in a stable, stable condition. Do you think the Samaritan could have been like, hey, you good now? Okay, I'm going to head on. I have a whatever. I got to go to the next town. You're good. Um, see you later type of a thing. If he ended the story right there, I would still think the Samaritan acted with compassion and did a good thing. He didn't need, he didn't have to go above and beyond, but he did. He didn't have to take the man to the nearest town, to the inn, and pay for you know, his, his hotel stay to make sure that uh, the man recovered. He didn't have to do that. But it was the compassion that moved him to do so. Again, because the Samaritan wanted to do that because he loved a stranger that he never met. He loved somebody that much that he wanted to do that. He didn't have to do that. Next uh, point here we'll talk about uh, is the assembly. Um, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but I want you to look and see the common theme of love here in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, starting verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. Now, I, I grew up in the church, and I can remember, ever since I can remember, honestly, as a kid, um, this verse was used like all, all the time. And it was always, don't forsake the assembly. You have to be here because you have to be here because you have to be here, right? Like, it's a command. You, you have to be here, right? And a lot of times, at least, you know, years ago, I feel like um, the idea of love was just completely overlooked. Um, I, I feel like in the recent, maybe in the recent decade or so, um, I have heard a lot more lessons about like um, wanting to be here because we want to, because we love God and we love the brethren. And that is also what I want to emphasize here is that what is the reason for being here? What is the reason that you and I come to church? Well, it says here in the verse preceding that, to stir up one another in love and good works. And in the verse following that, it says, exhort one another. We're here to encourage each other. We're here because we love the brothers and we love God. And it is so much easier, so much easier to be able to get up and go to church when you love one another. And, um, I mean, I've been at... Uh, I mean, I've been at several churches throughout my life. I know I'm not that old, but I moved around uh, fair enough as a, as a child and also throughout um, being in the military. But I've, I've been a part of churches that, um, you, know, you know, it could have been me. It could have been maybe my heart wasn't where it needed to be as far as uh, loving the brother. Um, but when you go to church and, you know, you're not – maybe you're not involved or maybe you don't love the brothers as you should, it is, it is kind of a drag. It is kind of hard to get yourself to go to church when you don't love the brethren. So the, the main idea here I want to convey is that if we love the brethren and we love God, the rest will take care of itself. Um, that, that's why we are here, because ultimately we should want to be here, not because we feel obligated or duty-bound to be here. Um, 
I feel like there is a, a, a better reason, and the ultimate reason is because of love, and that's why uh, we should be here today. Laboring for the Lord. All right, this is my, my last slide, so we might be getting out here a little bit early. I don't know. You can enjoy your Mother's Day a little bit early. Um, laboring for the Lord. Um, again, is this something that we do because we're commanded to? Because we are. <laughs> but Or is this something that we want to do because we love the Lord? Matthew 9, verse 37 says, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Matthew 22, verse 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. These two verses here give us the idea that there's not a whole lot of people out there that are laboring for the Lord. We use the phrase that, well, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? Well, the fact of the matter is everybody's not doing it because it's not easy. It's not easy to be a Christian and to do all these things because it does require work. And there's not a whole lot of people out there doing it. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is acknowledging that doing the work of the Lord is laborious. Because he's basically saying don't give up hope keep working keep working hard because in the end it'll be worth it because i will give you rest that's what jesus is saying he's acknowledging that it is a labor to do the work and second thessalonians we're we're going to turn over there we'll read that one second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 talking about don't grow weary in the work. Um, verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. What he's saying here is that keep doing what you're doing, don't grow weary in doing good. Because why else would he say that? Well, because there are people who are laboring, and there are people who get burnt out, and they end up falling away. They fall away from the faith, as he explains in the verses uh, below that. Um, this is something that, um, yes, it requires work. Uh, let's also go ahead and move on to the next verse, which is 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, starting verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is, the, Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Again, that's the, almost the exact same phrase that we had just read in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's reiterating this again. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. We just got done reading. Uh, there's not very many laborers in the church. There's few that are chosen. It requires heavy labor. And we're also being exhorted to not grow weary in the work. How, how can he say that his commandments are not burdensome? But doesn't it almost seem like kind of a, a contrast or like a, I don't know, like a oxymoron or something here that how can you say this is hard work, but yet my commandments are not burdensome? Like this should be easy for you. Right. This is this is almost it reads to me as like, hey, don't worry about doing the work of the Lord because it's not that bad. It's pretty easy. Right. Payments aren't burdensome. Um, I'll tell you why here in a minute. But uh, let me tell you a story real quick. Um, so, you know, this is several years ago um, when I, I had an old supervisor of mine, um, probably one of the best supervisors I ever had. 
um, when I was uh, stationed in Colorado. Um, really good guy, um, strong worth ethic. Um, anyway, just great, great supervisor all the way around. He took care of his people. I was his direct, like, uh, subordinate, uh, if you will. Um, he, he was really good. But anyways, um, so he, uh, he, was, he was Mormon, but he ended up leaving the faith. He ended up leaving the Mormon church, right? Um, so I had asked him, like, why, like, basically why? Like, why, what led you to leave the church, right? Um, and he said that, uh, you know, ever since he was a kid, you know, he grew up in that church, and, you know, he did the work. Um, he, you know, was a good, uh, you know, devout in the work at, at the Mormon church, and, you know, went on his two-year mission, as, as they all do, um, came back from his two-year mission, uh, continued to go to church. He was, you know, appointed as an as a elder, as they do, and he was uh, in charge of leading, uh, like, weekly Bible classes. Um, I'm not sure what kind of Bible classes, if they were, like, kids' Bible classes or adult classes, I'm not sure, but... Um, you know, he was, he was laboring, he was doing a lot of work, he was doing classes every single week, um, he had a new family, he had a wife, he had little children, um, at the time, just, you know, a couple years old, and, uh, he just said, you know what, like, eventually, it was just, it was just too much, I got burnt out, I was just, there was, I was expected to do so much, and I just, I just couldn't handle it, and he just said, like, I just ended up, I just didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. I just left, and, and now he just, he does what he wants to do, but he just, he, he just kind of do it. And, and I totally, I totally get that, especially being, you know, uh, a new father, doing so much, having little kids that you're, that you're responsible for as well. Um, but the thing that stuck out to me is just, it was a burden to him. It was a burden to him to have to go to church, to do the Bible lessons. It was an expectation to him. Like the pressure from the, the, the whole church around him that everybody is expected to do something. And for him... The expect, like, yes, he did. He did the commands that he was supposed to do, but his heart wasn't in it. The love was not inside him. Because if it was, if the love was there, then he would have continued on. He would have not grown weary, as the scripture tells us. He would have continued in it, continued in the love. But somewhere along the way, the love for God and the love for our brethren um, may dwindle, it may vanish. And when that happens, it is so hard. It is a lot harder to do these commands. So when this verse that says, my commandments are not burdensome, well, they're not. They're not burdensome if you love God and if you love the brethren. It's not a burden. It's just our heart has to be in the right spot. Um, this lesson, too, kind of hits home for me a little bit. Um, I've told a few of you, as you know, I have a sister. Uh, she left the faith. This was several years back. And kind of the similar situation with my old supervisor, except, you know, this is, this is my own sister, right? And I always try to explain it to myself, like, how did this happen, right? Because after all, my sister, we grew up in the same home. We have the same parents. Um, both were raised relatively the same. Except I was younger, so I probably got treated better than she did, because I was, I was the, the baby at the time. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Um, but several years ago, right, my sister decided that she didn't want to be a Christian anymore. She didn't want to, she didn't want to be, uh, be involved with the church. Um, and the thing that stuck out with me is that she said, is that I didn't want to pretend to be someone or something that I am not. Um, somewhere along the way, maybe she did, right? Maybe she did have that love. Um, and then maybe over time, um, 
it dwindled away. I don't know. I will give her credit. I give her credit for being honest because that's hard. That's super hard to tell your own family, hey, I can't do this because basically I'm faking it is what, what she was telling us. It's like, hey, I'm being a Christian um, for her was being fake because her heart wasn't in it anymore. Eventually, um, eventually she just lo- lost that love for God. and She lost the love um, for the brethren. And then doing the commands, right? Doing what God wants us to do as far as being generous, as far as being hospitable, as far as, you know, showing up, um, being at church, as far as laboring for the Lord, those things were hard for her. Those things were a burden to her because she had lost the love, the love of God. Um, So this morning, um, I hope and pray, I want to encourage you all um, to take some self-reflection. There's a passage that we all, you have to work out your own salvation with with fear and trembling. Um, Please reflect and see whether uh, you are in the faith or not, because the only person that's going to know your heart is you and God. Only yourself. I can't, I'm not up here. My job isn't to be up here and say, you know, I think your heart's not where it's at, or I think your actions reflect you're not where you're supposed to be in your walk with Christ. I can't do that because it's your responsibility to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, please, just, uh, again, I just encourage you uh, to, to reflect uh, this morning. Uh, reflect about why is it we do the things that we do? Are we doing, are we coming to church? Are we being generous, hospitable, laboring for the Lord? Because we just, that's an expectation put upon our, our peers, our expectation put upon our family. Is it because I feel duty driven to do this? Or is it because of a greater cause, of a greater need? Is that I'm doing this because I want to do this. Because I love God, and I love the brothers here. Um, I will also say that this, the church here has been great. Um, again, I'm not calling anybody out, but it is since we've been here in Arizona, the coming to church is easy. It's easy coming here because there's so many of you guys here that are so loving and so kind. Um, that, you know, following the commands, right, is, is easy when you love each other. And I feel like we have that here. Um, so this morning, um, if, if you have a need, if you are already a Christian, if you need the prayers of the congregation, we can do that for you. If there's anything that uh, you need help with or are struggling with, um, or by chance, if you're not a Christian and, and you would like to be baptized um, and uh, today we can do that. Uh, we'd also, we, I mean, we have like a relatively new baptism. That's like a baptistry that's over there. And if that doesn't work, we could always go to, you know, probably Laura's house. I think probably. I don't know. Uh, uh, she has a pool, by the way. Um, but anyways, if if you have a need, uh, please come uh, as we stand and as we sing.